multitask with me as we continue in our series on the book of Matthew, Matthew chapter 9. Uh, Matthew chapter 9. Uh, we'll begin reading at verse 35 today uh, as we go to the anchor text. I'm excited about this one. This is the anchor text. Um, and as we, hey, Lisa, how are you? What are y'all doing here? Y'all moved back? They, listen, we grew up, we, our kids, their kids was in my youth group, and I was in their youth group because they were mentors of mine, and they moved away. And the, oh, oh, there you go. Uh, and they moved away, and y'all moved back. Y'all moved back just in time for offering. Praise the Lord. <laughs> that was so good. So good to see you guys. Um, uh, so open those Bibles to Matthew chapter 9. Oh, y'all thought I got distracted. I'm still on task. Come on, open the Bibles. Let's go, baby. Uh, Open the Bibles, Matthew chapter 9. As we continue in our series, we're rounding third and heading for home. Uh, I've been giving you a theological vision of what it means to be moved. Now you're going to see us begin to call you into action in what does it mean to live a moved life. Uh, We're going from vision to now strategy and then action. Uh, So we're going to begin to turn that corner a little bit. Over the next two weeks, you don't want to miss it uh, as we lay out our full vision of what we sense God calling us, who he's calling us to be, and then what he's actually calling us to do. We get to dive into that really hard over the next three weeks. Today, we pick it up, verse 35. This is our anchor text in our whole series. Um, King James Version, let's hear these words of our Father as he speaks to us. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, watch this now, he was moved with compassion for them because they were weary and scattered. One translation says, um, uh, helpless, uh, and hurting. Um, uh, they were like, like sheep, he says, having no shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers, everyone say laborers, are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into the harvest. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you so much for this privilege to open up your word. Now, as we consecrate this time, would you place a spiritual parenthesis on this moment? Would you so capture and captivate our hearts and our minds in a way that we might hear you ever so clearly? Father, would you take our hearts, capture them in a way that we won't miss not one thing that you have for us today. God, it's to that end that I ask that in these few moments, in this parenthesis, that you would speak to us, that you would that you would stand in my body, think through my mind, speak through my vocal cords, those things you would have us say, know, and do. Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight. O Lord, you are my strength. You are my redeemer. Get glory in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, Bible says that he went uh, to the villages, the synagogues, to the towns. Uh, And as he went from from town to village to, to synagogue, he was declaring the good news. He was, he was declaring the good news, telling them of the kingdom of God. Somebody shout kingdom. kingdom. He, he was speaking to them concerning the kingdom and the good news that the kingdom brings, that the kingdom was breaking in. And as he was sharing this good news, he comes to the place around verse 35 where he begins to reflect on all that he had seen. He says, as I went to bring good news, I couldn't help but see the bad news that was already there. So many times when we talk about the gospel, we celebrate the good news of the gospel. But the good news is only good news 
because it's coming to speak to bad news. Jesus, the Savior of the world, seeing firsthand the bad news. He says, I saw multitudes of people. I saw multitudes of people. And he says, they were like sheep without a shepherd. In other words, they were lost. Imagine seeing your children and they're lost. Don't know where to go. Don't know how to be. Searching for direction. Distraught. I don't, I don't know if you've ever been lost, but there's a fear. There's a, there's a weariness that comes with being lost. And Jesus says, when I saw my children, when I saw my people, this is what they look like. They look lost. Like sheep without a shepherd. Not knowing which way to go. Not knowing which way to turn. Jesus says, my children were lost. If you got children, can you imagine what it's like to see your own children when they're lost and afraid and not knowing where to go? Not only that, but he says they were lost, and then he adds another word. He says they were, they were weary. They were helpless. Not only were they helpless, but they were hurting, in pain. He paints this picture as he, as he says, as I went through all the multitudes and I was coming to tell them good news, but what I saw were people who were lost, people who were hurting, and they were helpless. They couldn't help themselves. Seeking, but not finding. Looking, but not seeing. Thirsting, but never their thirst being quenched. They were lost, helpless, and hurting. Not only did I see my children, my loved ones, imagine being Jesus. Jesus wasn't surprised at this, but his heart was still broken by it. Imagine your children being lost, helpless, and hurting. Not only that, but then he adds another word. In the NIV, he uses this word that captures it. He says they were lost, they were helpless, they were hurting, and then he says they were harassed. Not only were they helpless and hurting, but an enemy would come and harass them, would taunt them, antagonize them. Not only am I already hurting, not only am I already helpless, but you come and you harass my children? They were lost, helpless, hurting, and now daily being harassed by the enemy. And he says, and I watched this and I saw this front hand. My children lost, helpless, hurting, and harassed. And when I saw this, I was moved with compassion. Implication, Jesus says, when I saw it, I could not un." see it. I couldn't unsee it because you can't see your children lost, hurting, helpless, and harassed and not be moved. You cannot see my children lost, hopeless, helpless, and harassed and not be moved. Or can you? can you? Maybe I should say it like this. You can't see his children be lost, hurting, and harassed and not be moved if you have a heart of Jesus. You have the heart of Jesus. Jesus said, I saw this and I was moved with compassion in the deepest place. We've talked about this before. Remember, we talked about that word move there. It's the idea in the Greek. It literally translates the word bowels. It actually means I wasn't moved in my heart. I was moved 
in the deepest part of my being. I was moved in my bowels. That's why I'm telling you, church, it's not enough for you to be moved in your heart because you can see this, be moved in your heart, and go to in and out and completely forget about it. He says, I need you to be moved deeper than that. When you, when you see my children lost, hurting, helpless, and harassed, go harass somebody that's already helpless. You're going to taunt and push someone that's already helpless? He says, you should be moved so deeply that it gets in a place in you that you cannot move forward the same way. Friends, that's the vision of the church. That's who God has called us to be. And in this image, in this story, there are three things that we see happening concerning the kingdom of God, that he's moving us toward the kingdom of God. Number one, we see the hope of the kingdom. Number two, we see the call of the kingdom. And number three, the sacrifice of the kingdom. Y'all just going to look at me and not write nothing down? You should take a note if something. Come on, I've been working on this all week, and you're just going to sit and... Think you're just going to look, huh? No, get it, open your notes. Open your notes app or something. Hope of the kingdom. The calling of the kingdom. The call of the kingdom. And the sacrifice of the kingdom. Number one, he says, I want you to see the hope of the kingdom. Number one, we know that there's hope. What? Because Jesus says, I've seen my people in their pain. See, that's already hope right there. Because one of the biggest lies of the enemy is that when you go through your pain, that God don't see you. God can't hear your cry. God can't see your tears. God does not feel your pain. I'm telling you, you've got a God who what is, it is not lost on him, the pain that he sees in your life. And if he sees it, you know he's going to do something about it. We've got a God that knows he's going to do. He says, I see this hurting. I see this pain. I see it. And I also see the enemy that is harassed. And the hope of the kingdom is that Jesus has come to make all things new. So even though the enemy and the adversary is there, he is strong, but he cannot be compared to the power of the resurrection of Jesus Christ that will come in the fullness of his splendor. So he can say to my daughter, my son, hold on, hope and help is on the way because Jesus Christ came, died on the cross so that when he got up, he can get up with the kind of victory that can raise up hopeless people, a kind of victory that will lift up bow down heads, a kind of victory that would encourage discouraged hearts. So although he's intimidating, although he's strong, he ain't none compared to the resurrection power of Jesus Christ. Although the enemy may have a loud bark in your life, let me tell you, his bite ain't there. Why? Because of the victory over the grave, I took the sting out of his bite. I took the sting out of death, took the victory over the grave. So he says there's hope, not just a hope for now, but a hope for eternity. There's an eternal hope. Because one day, regardless of what's going on in this world, we will leave this world and we will stand before God. And when you stand before God, he's going to be looking for that eternal hope that's marked on your heart. What does that look like? Oh, it's the blood of Jesus. It's the blood of Jesus. He says he died on the cross, shed his blood so that you can walk around and wear that blood with victory every single day of your life. Because in that, you get victory over death, hell, and the grave. He says, so I want you to get a glimpse that not only do I see your pain, but I have come to do something about your pain. I've come to remove the harasser. No longer will you be harassed. No longer will you be helpless. No longer will you be hurting because hope, the eternal hope of the kingdom of God has come to set you free. Amen? There, there's an eternal hope. There, there, there's the hope of the kingdom. 
But I, but I love this. There's also the call of the kingdom. Everybody say the call. Turn to your neighbor and say, get ready for the call. Uh, that neighbor sleep. Turn to another neighbor. That was pitiful. Turn to another neighbor. Turn to another neighbor and say, get ready for the call. Here, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. The disciples up until now, they ultimately won't get it until he ascends. I, I, I mean, you can see even at the last minute, you can tell they don't see the calling in the depth of what God is calling them to. They, they don't see it fully, but they get a glimpse here. Now imagine they're watching Jesus, and he's healing, delivering. He's raising from the dead, like homeboy is doing his thing. Like he's, I'm sorry, homeboy. Uh, dear brother, befriended one, uh, one of kindred spirit, uh, homeboy. Um, he, he's doing his thing. He, he raises raising up folks from the dead, and the disciples are seeing this. And, I mean, they're just thinking, oh, man, like Jesus has got to get to everybody on earth. And, and we've got to be great, great facilitators of long lines. We've got to try to find a way to get organized lines and to try to engineer ways so that we can set it up so Jesus can just do this all day and take naps and hold people back and then wake him up and then come on, let Jesus, like, we got to figure out because that's, that's the most we can contribute is to organize the lines. That's the most we can contribute is just to facilitate them getting Jesus because that's the best we got to offer. But Jesus in this moment flips the call. He says, no, 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 no. The harvest is plenteous. You, you've seen me do this stuff, and you've seen the harvest, and you've seen the fruit of it. The idea of harvest is you sow a seed, and then corn comes up, and you see the corn. You've been seeing transformation come up. You've been seeing deliverance come up. You've been seeing transformation come up. You've been seeing people's lives transformed, and I'm telling you, that's plenteous. The harvest is plenteous. And I'm going to do the work of the harvest. I'm going to do the, the miraculous. Don't worry about that. I'm going to do the miraculous stuff. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring the harvest up. I need somebody to bring the harvest in. Did, did you get that? I, I'm going to bring the harvest up. I'm going to do the transformation. Only the gospel can transform hearts and lives. I mean, let me tell you something. I don't care how much you talk to somebody, how much you cry with somebody, how much you tell somebody how wrong they are. They need the power of the Holy Spirit to turn the light of God on in their heart and their life. Jesus does that. So we deliver the truth, we sow the seed, but Jesus gives the increase, amen, right? He says the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. That, that flips him because they've been sitting there thinking about the labor, the, the harvest. And he says, no, 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 it's not about the harvest. It's about the laborers. In other words, you sitting there saying, Jesus, I can't, we can't do this without you. And Jesus is saying to them, and I won't do it without you. Did you get that? Oh, that was good up at the top of the balcony. Was that good? Did it feel that good, as good up there as it did down here? It felt really good right here. <laughs> they're looking at Jesus and they're saying, Jesus, we can't do this without you. We can't raise no dead girl. We can't give hope to hopeless people. And Jesus is looking at them and says, and I won't do it without you. You're going to be involved in the deepest of levels. The laborers are few. I'm calling you into the kingdom of God. I'm calling you into this work. I'm calling you into this work. I guess what I'm trying to say is God has done more than call you to sit in that seat. He says, no, I didn't call you to sit in that seat. I've called you into this work. Why? Because I've got children that are lost, that are helpless, that are hurting, and that are harassed. And my God, you can't sit in that seat and see that and just keep going to work on Monday and living life as normal. You see that and you move with compassion and it changes then how you live. And I'm calling you into the work of the kingdom. Reggie, where are you? Where, where are you, Reggie? Reggie? Reggie's like, I'm taking a break. There he is. Reggie, is. Reggie, I'm going to put you to work. Reggie, what happened is, Reggie says yes to Jesus. 
Reggie says yes to Jesus. Okay, okay, all right. And see, a lot of times we think that Jesus has said yes to Reggie. We think, we think Reggie, we think Jesus is going to become, now that we didn't hooked up, Reggie got his own brand, his own kingdom, his own will, his own way, and now Jesus is his number one sponsor. So we think Jesus has said yes to Reggie's brand, which means Reggie can tag Jesus on to all his great ideas, to all his great hopes, to all his great dreams, and all his kingdom hopes. I, I am here to build the kingdom of Reggie. So all the stuff that Reggie got on his vision board, he get to put sponsored by Jesus on the corner, right? Here's the problem. Jesus didn't die on the cross to be Reggie's sponsor. Jesus died on the cross to be Reggie's savior. Do you, do you understand what I'm saying? There is a big difference between the two and how you see this then shapes how you live this. I'll say that again. How you see this then shapes how you live this. A lot of us look at Jesus. I said yes to Jesus. I, I, I worship Jesus. Worship me with your other hand because I see your other hand. There you go. I worship Jesus. And now if I could just get Jesus to come to my situation and come and fulfill my agenda and come and fulfill my brand promise that I've made to my 600 Instagram followers. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? No, 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 no. You didn't say yes to Jesus so Jesus could come down into your kingdom. You said yes to Jesus so Jesus could bring you up into his kingdom. I'm bringing him up into my kingdom. And watch this. When you bring Jesus, no, go back down. When you bring, when Jesus brings you up into his kingdom, he's bringing you into the fullness of his work. And the work, and just in case you're wondering what the work of his kingdom looks like, He's bringing you into the fullness of this work. Do you, do you see that? He's bringing you into this work. Now, I don't care if you're an engineer, a school teacher, a, a boardroom worker, a, a, a stay-at-home dad, an a, a entrepreneur. I don't, care. I don't care what your job is. I don't even care what your work is. I know what your assignment is. Your assignment is to care for the hurting, the least, and the lost. Oh, I wish I had better witnesses up in here than that. I'm preaching better than you shouting up in here today. See, this is a big thing. Lest you think your job as a Christian is to come and sit in a chair and watch me every week. That's not the sum total of your salvation. I appreciate you coming. I'm glad you're here. Hope you come back again. But I hope you ain't planning to stand before Jesus with your attendance record at Fellowship Monrovia. Because boo, if that's all you got, boo, boo, who you? Do, do you understand what I'm saying? Like God has called you into more than me trying to fulfill your brand. I ain't here to make you look better. You are here to fulfill my kingdom assignment that I have over your life. Do you get the difference? If you don't see that right, then you will think that being a Christian is about going to church, fulfilling devotionals, and once a year, you go and give a turkey to somebody who probably don't even want to eat that dried up nasty turkey no way. <laughs> do, do you understand what I'm saying? That is not what it is to be a follower of Jesus Christ. That is not what it is for a church to be a church. This is what a church does. A church says yes to Jesus. They enlist into his mission and his calling, and they get about the work of Jesus Christ, which is unleashing compassion and hope in the world. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? That's what the church is called to do. He says, and I'm calling you to do that work. That's the calling. You know what the calling is? I don't care if you're a business, if you run a business. This, this ain't a call, call to pastoral ministry. Don't, don't spend all your money going to seminary and say, because, because God told me to be a pastor. No, 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 that's not it. You need to be a pastor at AT&T. 
You need to be a pastor at Verizon. You, you need to be a pastor at the insurance company. You need to be a pastor at the DMV. Lord Jesus, you need to be a pastor at the DMV. We need some people with callings on their life. He says to them, the harvest is plenteous, but the laborers are few. And I'm bringing you in to be a laborer because I need my children to take care of my children. And the calling on their life is to care for my children. Greatness is service, and the greatest among you is he who serves. We're called to unleash compassion and hope in the world. And this is what the calling of the kingdom looks like when it's lived out. Do, do you understand what I'm saying? What I love about it is he doesn't have to come and fight the devil. No, 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 no. Jesus says he already lost. Don't stop tripping about him. He ain't nothing. Ain't nobody scared of you. <laughs> he look all hard and whatnot. Ain't nobody scared of him. I ain't calling you to fight devils. I'm calling you to love my children and I'll fight the devil. I'll stand, I'll have your back. This, this is important because fear will grip you. Be like, I'm scared. What, the enemy ain't gonna like this. What the devil, what people gonna say? Nobody care nothing about that. He already lost. Why are you tripping over somebody that's already lost? You know what I'm saying? Like the devil is crazy. He will try to taunt you and try to have you scared and you just be like, bro, you lost already. Like you ain't even winning, you lost. How am I gonna be scared of somebody that's already lost? I'm not. Jesus is saying, I'll cover you. The blood of Jesus has got your back. Focus on my children. Focus on caring for them. Focus on providing for them. Focus on breaking the cycles and the systems, both spiritually, physically, emotionally, socially. Jesus says, I've come to bring restoration to all, but I'm going to bring restoration to all through you. Do, do you see that? He says, I'm going to do the work, but I've chosen to do the work through you for my glory. The eternal, the hope of the kingdom, the call of the kingdom, and now finally the sacrifice of the kingdom. Because let me tell you something. If you think you're just going to love on God's children, let me, let me get in here, let me love on y'all. Jesus says, I want to come and I want to love I want to love on my children, but how I'm going to love on my children? I'm going to love on my hurting, helpless children through my children. Through, it, it is through my children. Lisette, come up here. Help, help me out. It, it is through my children that I want to love on my people. Connie, come up here. Help me. Help me love on, love on these children. It is through my children as I bring my church together, and they, they love them. They, they, they show up in these hurting spaces. They show up. They come. Connie. Come, come stand behind there. Go hug. I get my children in my church to wrap around and to love my hurting, my hurting children. I get them to, I, I get them to show up in those spaces. And as love is being displayed on the earth. Here, let me tell you something. If you think you're going to get this, this, this vision, if you're going to experience this place of where hope and deliverance begins to show up, where healing begins to come and restoration begins to come, you think that's going to show up? without sacrifice? You, you think you're going to get to this kind of healing and deliverance without sacrifice? You, you think you're going to show up and pack your comfort as well? See, what we'll say is, I'll show up and I'll do that and I'm willing to do it. And you'll have moments like this in church where we want to be compassionate, where we want to be loving, and we want to take on the world. You know there are children right now being, that are helpless and hurting and being harassed by the enemy because they don't have a mother, they don't have a father who loves them. There are people who are sitting right now hungry, have no idea how to get food, not because food places aren't up the street, because they don't even have the mental capacity to put the resources together to get them to a place to even be fed. There are people literally hurting, helpless, and harassed on our watch. And you think that change is going to come to their life without sacrifice? You know why I say that? Because we say, yeah, I'll be there. As long as it doesn't require time, me giving anything, 
or me financially providing anything. We would never get here without sacrifice. So that's why for the next two years in particular, we're calling our church to show up intentionally, sacrificially. Because on our watch, we will no longer see people helpless, hurting, and harassed, and we do nothing. Not on our watch. So we're calling us to sacrifice. And I'm telling you, there's no way you get to this place without sacrifice. Ladies, I don't know how y'all do all of this with in a dress. <laughs> There's no way to get there. So we're calling our church to sacrifice. Over the next two weeks, we're going to begin to reveal what the actual strategy will look like, what we want to actually call our church to do. But today, I just want you to know why we're about to do it. Because there are people that are hurting, helpless, and, and God says we're his plan A for them. There is no plan B. There's a song that captured my heart. I was thinking about this sermon and thinking about our church and thinking about the sacrifice that God is calling us to make. It's an old song from the early 90s, old whining song. But the lyrics so gripped my heart. I was in San Jose on Monday. Flew home Tuesday morning. From the time I took off in San Jose to the time I landed, I was listening to the words of this song and I cried the whole way. Till I landed in Burbank, I was just in tears. Cried through the peanuts. Cried through the drink tray. It was like, what's wrong with you? I just said, Ginger ale, please. This. <laughs> the word said this. Listen to these words. It says, Oh, oh, now I see it's you I need. And with your help, did I myself? pulling him out of. Get all the way down because I want it to be dramatic when I pull you up. <laughs> says a part of coming to the gospel means I don't, I don't live for myself. I don't live for my will. I don't live for my way. I don't live for me. But I live for something greater. And when I say yes to Jesus, that means I'm sacrificing all so that I might receive all. He's not standing on the steps negotiating terms with God. That's God says, I didn't come to negotiate with you. I came to save you, deliver you, and bring you all the way into the purpose that I destined and planned for your life. So when he says that, he says, oh, now I see. It's you I need, God. And then the song says, so with your help, I'll deny myself put my hand in yours and when you put your hand in his hand he puts your hand in their hands yeah. oh that was good did you see that yeah. lift it up one more time say oh now I see it's you I need Put my hand in yours. 
Oh, y'all got it yet? Sing it with me. of the church of Jesus Christ. This is who we are and this is who we've been called to be. That means this is who you are. It's who you've been called to be. It's time to get up out of the comfortable seats of the church and stand in the called place of the kingdom. Ooh, that was good. I'm going to say that again, and then I need y'all to clap really loud after I say that. That was good. I'm going to say that again. It's time for you to get out of the comfortable seats of the church and stand in the called place of the kingdom of God. Come on, stand up on your feet. church to sacrifice, calling us to sacrifice. God has given us a vision that it's the biggest sacrifice, the biggest thing we've ever done. It means our time, our talent, and our treasure. Can I just go ahead and, I'm just going to go ahead and tell you so you can begin to pray now with your families. Pray now. As we unveil this over the next two weeks, I need you to be praying because God has given us a big vision to help folks that have been waiting on the church to show up. They're waiting on us. And Jesus is saying, this is who I've chosen. It ain't coming from the White House. It's coming from God's house. It's coming from God's house. And I'm not saying that just because of who's in the White House now. It wasn't coming from the White House then. It ain't coming from the White House now. Next, next, next election, it ain't going to come from it then. It was never. If he wanted a government takeover, he would have come as a government official. He didn't come like that. He came not on the backs of a donkey or of an elephant, but he came reigning as the King of kings and the Lord of lords, ushering in the kingdom of God. In order for us to do it, it's going to require laborers, folks that are willing to sacrifice. For the next two years, next two years, we want to intentionally focus in creating and unleashing hope and compassion. So we want to sacrificially set aside the next two years' resources to be able to do that. We're going to unpack it and talk about it over the next two weeks, but can I just start get you praying right now because it's going to be so big. It's going to take all the prayers we can get plus some we can borrow. I've been calling friends from other pastors from other churches saying, can we borrow some of your prayers? We need them. In addition to our regular giving, we want to believe God. In addition to all that we already give, we want to believe God for an additional $5 million over the next two years so that we can give it away for compassion and hope in the earth. If it was just me and my family, we couldn't do it. If 
it was just this section over here, we probably couldn't do it. Oh, actually, no, I didn't see you over there. We probably could do it. <laughs> Here's what I know for sure. If we all come together and sacrifice, it's no question in my mind that we can't do it as the family of God. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And that's not even including the 1145 service. That's just going to be extra. They come late. They ain't got much. So we... <laughs> it's, it's, this is, this is the bread and butter right here, 1145, that's going to be extra. We're just going to take that and put it on top, amen? Don't tell them I said that. I'm going to tell them they're the most important when they come in, but we know the truth. No. Would you grab your neighbor's hand? Well, before you do that, before you do that, would you thank our actors? Look at them. Don't they look helpless, harassed, and hurting? Don't they look, they look terrible. Y'all look terrible. It's awesome. Y'all look terrible. Right. Connie, stay up here. Y'all stay up here. Grab your neighbor's hand. Stretch across the aisle. Y'all come up here with me. Let's sing it one more time as we go home. Sing it all. so good. Would you just turn to your neighbor and tell them, let's get to work. Turn around, tell them, let's get to work. Some of y'all just set to the wrong, y'all set to the wrong row. I mean, some of y'all, they're just a bad row. Turn around and tell somebody else, let's leave comfort and let's head towards kingdom. Tell them, tell them. I know their hands are sweaty, but God, give them grace. I know. <laughs> One last thing. I never want fear to interfere with what God's called you to do. Yes. And some folks, he's calling you to do some hard things. Yeah. Financially, we're going to need folks to sacrifice big. Time-wise, we're going to need folks to sacrifice big. Yeah. It's going to require a lot of sacrifice. And I just need you to get your neighbor ready. I need you to get them ready. So I need you to say this as though you from South Central LA. I know you probably not. I probably, you never probably even drove by there. But, but just, I, I just need you to act like you real hard. And I want you to look at your neighbor and tell them, we ain't scared. white lady. She ain't never talked like that before in her life. <laughs> Welcome to fellowship. Lord, thank you so much. Now I see it's you we need. So with your help, we deny ourselves, put our hands in yours, and it will all be for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you, fellowship. Have a great week. Sing it all.